Welcome, beloved, to the Tending the Roots podcast, where we explore the frontier lands of new culture creation. I'm your sometimes host, Corrine Bell, and along with the co-dreamers and friends of the Rooted Global Village, we'll be in conversation, exploration, and play with changemakers, scholar activists, and teachers dedicated to culture change work and seeding futures. Today on the podcast, we have the one and only Oceana Sawyer with us. Oceana is an end-of-life doula, and she's focused on the liminal space of active dying and grief. And I'm telling y'all, I know few people who are as curious, as open, and as dedicated as Oceana is. Among many other things that Oceana does in the world, She's also one of our team members in Rooted, and she holds spaces for grief. She's also the author of the book, Life, Death, Grief, and the Possibility of Pleasure. And what can I say? In this conversation, we kind of explore it all. We talk about the role of grief, um, not just as this individual process we go through when we lose someone, but grief as this great metabolizer of experience, this composter of experience, and the important role that grief plays in our lives and in the world to come. We'll be sure to include links to where you can learn more about Oceana. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy this conversation. I've got a friend who's all about the cold dip in the ocean, you know, the Wim Hof stuff. I do that every day. Do you? Where do you? Yeah, where a, do you do I do. It? A, I just do a little cold bath in my. I mean, you you can in your create bathroom. them. Yeah. No, I mean I don't do it in the bathroom, but you can, you can even create like a tub, right? Like you can go to a Home Depot and get like a, like a what do you call that? Um, oh, just like a like, container of tin some kind. Tubs? You can get a tin one. You can get a plastic one, and you just you can like dump ice in it, and like I, I do it a few times a week. Oh, good for you. It's Look amazing, at you all actually. Shiny now, yes. Well, I mean, I have to say, I, 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 the the first time I remember having the experience of plunging in cold water because I'm not an I'm not an ocean cold water swimmer. I'm a, I don't I can't swim, so that's my problem. So I I never had that experience. I'm sure a lot of people just know that naturally from being swimmers, but the first time I experienced it was at like a, a gym or it wasn't a gym. It was like a wellness center in Switzerland many years ago. And I went there and I did the sauna, you know, for your 20 minutes. And then I saw these people going into a cold bath and I was like, why would they want to do that? That's like, like why would you want to go into freezing water after you just had this wonderful experience of warming up? And finally I was like, well, it must be, it must be interesting. So I decided to try it. And I was like, zing 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 electrified like it felt so um, and I felt so amazing afterward even though it's hard to do in the moment I in fact actually it's funny Cliff and I just had a really fun conversation very spontaneous conversation about it recently where somehow the subject came up and we were talking about like that that kind of the dual experience of being at your edge and experiencing pleasure at the same time so if like discomfort and pleasure t- simultaneously and that was like a perfect description of what that experience feels like oh you are definitely in my zone right now I yeah that was exactly yes nice yeah i mean you know pleasure as you know it's just an interpretation of mm. temperature, pressure, and whatever, you know, the elements is just an interpretation. And you can decide um, at any moment that what's happening is pleasurable. I mean, aside from harm, and even, you know, there's all degrees of harm, right? There's people who are really into BDSM, and that looks like that could be harm under a certain set of circumstances. But in that circumstance, yeah. it's pleasurable because it was set up and, you know, there's agreement. So yeah, pleasure and pain are really fun edges to work. Yeah. So I, interesting I, to bring that one up too, because yeah, and like I'm curious, like what are the elements that actually make it possible to experience that as pleasurable? Like what you're saying, you know, the the safety or the or the experience that I'm relatively safe in this context, the consent, like the choice 
in it. Mm -hmm. It makes it makes me think too of like, I don't know why this isn't making me think of this, but you know, years ago I would go for a week at a time and do these meditation retreats for, you know, in, uh, in Switzerland, I would, I would be able to do these. And, you know, these experiences are very interesting. I, I used to have a friend who would always wish me, um, a, <laughs> whenever I would go, she'd be like, have a great time. And I was like, you clearly have never been on a meditation retreat before. <laughs> <because> <laughs> I wouldn't describe as I wouldn't describe going on retreat as uh you know like a spa day right because you're 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 willingly putting yourself in a situation to be confronted with all that you might otherwise distract yourself from in your daily life anyway you know the story so, so <laughs> but I remember one time so sitting hard. in this practice and you know you're meditating 10 hours a day in different forms and during this one practice I'm sitting there on the cushion and I start experiencing this like pain in my butt, like this intense kind of like piercing pain. And as I'm, as I'm like, as I'm noticing it, of course, every time I, I, I feel it, I kind of tense up around it. You know, the thing that you do when, when the interpretation of the experience in the moment is pain. And then of course, because I'm in this practice, um, this Vipassana practice. And one of the invitations is to be able to lean in and be curious about the experience that we call pain. What I did was I leaned into it. I mean, I opened up some, a space of curiosity about the experience I call pain. What does it, what is it made up of? Like, what is it made up of? Like, what are the elements? So I, I went there, I just went there with my awareness and I stayed with it rather than kind of pulling away from it and being like prickly around it. I went into it. And when I went into it, what did I find? It was so interesting. It was this very, it was actually a, a figure eight pattern of this like wave, like um, this, like the sensation that just kind of went back and forth in this wave, like sensation, like wave, like pattern, figure eight pattern. And around it were like, maybe it was like a little bit of like tingling and like there's, there were other sensations, but it was like this, I don't know, melange of like sensation. And that's all that it was. And when I was there, it was so interesting how quickly I realized that I could actually stay here and it didn't hurt. And not only didn't, did it not hurt, it was, it was actually kind of interesting. So bordering on pleasure, right? It was one of the most, I mean, it sounds such a, it sounds like such a small moment, but such a small moment can be so instructive about so many other moments in our lives, right? Like that, like, what is this moment right now actually made up of? And is it pain or is that just the label we're giving it because we can't tolerate the idea of going into it and finding out what's there. And sometimes I just want to acknowledge there is just pain <laughs> or it's too much, right? It's too much to go into. It can be too much to go into. I get migraines that are like that sometimes and a lot of compassion for people with a lot of chronic pain, but it is a very, when we can do it, or even if we can't go into the pain, even to skirt the edges of it, you know, and just have curiosity there is its own really interesting exploration. Wow. Oh, I'm going to try not to launch into a 30 minute lecture. <laughs> oh, I'd <laughs> love to hear a what's lecture. available in the exploration of sensation. And, um, you know, it's sort of like what you did with your exploration of pain. You can do that exact same exploration with pleasure. Mm hmm. And see how that opens up a very minute experience. Like I'm looking at this beeswax candle I have going and I just sort of lit it. But if I spent really some time with it and some curiosity, it sort of opens up like all layers of experience. Like now there's sort of, I can actually feel the warmth coming off this tiny flame. It's because I put my attention there and expanded my awareness to like include it. And so, so much more becomes available. And yeah. 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 And, and then it's like, 
again, you know, it's like we were from the beginning, these interpret these pain pain and pleasure, they're just interpretations. You just make of them what you want. And I'm more about the exploration into it that 100 you know and by the way just side note that's how you go from having an orgasm that's essentially a pelvic sneeze into hours long experience. orgasm mm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah that's mm. how it's done just with your it's, attention and curiosity yes yes Wow, I did not expect this conversation today. See, I told you I could start a half hour long lecture, but I won't. I'm done. I kind of love it, honestly. No, and honestly, yeah. I think not only do I love it because I I I have definitely been. Um, I I love what you said about you know the kind of the um, expanding of the moment of a pleasurable moment and the leaning into and being curious about that moment and how important that feels, especially, and I'm, I'm speaking for myself right now because I've had a lot of difficult moments recently. And, you know, when that's happening and as we know, we we're all going through it, it, you know, in peaks and valleys all the time, but we know that, you know, when, when there is a lot, I mean, I, I know that when there's a lot happening that I can become very oriented to what's wrong so quickly. Yes. And it's mm -hmm. really, really hard to, at times it's very, very hard to distract away from that, to reorient to something like pleasure. Pleasure might be all around me, even in the moment that I am, a, you know, kind of fixated on what's wrong. There is pleasure happening all around me, but I don't have access to that. I don't have access to that data because I'm not paying attention there, right? Like you, like you're talking about. I'm I'm fixated on on this or that thing that's not going well or right, and it's just proliferating. You know, it, I used to talk about it like it just, you know, these kind of negative thought loops or the negative orientations. They just have babies. <laughs> they just proliferate. And they can, you know, they have a momentum of their own. And so there's something that feels so exquisite about, and in the simplicity of a practice, as simple as the one that you just described, like watching a flame and tending to the qualities of pleasure within the flame. That is so beautiful to me. And the idea of it as a practice to just break the pattern of the negative orientation is is so simple, but so profound. And, and it calls into mind, actually, I, I, I think I feel, I feel like there, and I know this is what you wrote about in your book, but like this, you know, the ability to find where kind of the pleasure and the joy and life lives in grief is, is such a, such a fascinating field of exploration. <laughs> that was gorgeous segue. I was actually going to make that exact same segue, um, but without, without mentioning my book. But thank you for that. Um, no, no, mention your book. Mention your book always. <laughs> mention your book always. Um, yeah, this idea of, you know, where, this is a muscle that just like meditation you, I, I love the way you talked about how, well, you don't feel like you have access to it, you know, in the moment, but then you got around to saying, well, but it's a practice. And so it is a muscle that you can exercise. I myself have spent 20 years cultivating mm. this muscle. So I can turn on a dime from um, a pain oriented experience to a pleasure one. Um, but I have just put time into cultivating that. I will also say that the reason why we get into doom loops is because that is literally the air that we breathe. We are programmed all around, have our attention on what's wrong, what's bad, what's painful, what's awful, what's tragic. If that's in the air. We can go there in a heartbeat. We can stay there as long, you know, as, as we, hours can go by and you can still be yeah. in that loop because that's what the, 
if you will, the cultural energy is set at like pain and doom. So to go in this other direction is, it takes effort. It just literally takes effort. And so no shame on anybody who's like, oh, I don't have that. You know, like, why would you? There's not, there's so little in our environment that is orienting us towards having our attention placed on anything besides what's wrong or what's bad. And so that's kind of why I like this, this sort of what I love the way Keila talked about this in her episode, that liminal space of between one thing, one iteration of something and the next, there's this space in between. And it's sort of like what you were talking about in your meditation. There's the moment of pain and then there is this liminal space of curiosity and then you land you find yourself in a different realm and so this cultivation of these liminal spaces is my jam this is where i i find um where you can the capacity for infinite curiosity is available it's just like there's so many ways to go and so many things to look at and, and be with and so I think that this way that I talk about grief is really a space of the liminal between what mm -hmm. has passed, what, ha what you are, is no longer in your world in whatever way to what is wants to emerge from there. And the the capacity for creation in that liminal space is, is huge. Mm -hmm. And it's very tempting. And a lot of people have this experience that I've seen this people go from a loss to, okay, we'll just suck it up and, you know, just get back to what there was before. Mm -hmm. So the so-called normal, and that's such a misuse of, in my mind of the loss. It's not even a, you know, when when something gives its life, oh, have you seen all those pictures about the whales who have beached themselves? Yes. In order, in, and some people are interpreting that as a communication. Mm. The oceans are dying. You need to, we, can, we need to wake up. So this this idea that living beings can sacrifice themselves when you a, a death is a is a huge gift actually uh, or it can be it's not always and people have different interpretations of whatever you know that was but there is always a possibility of interpreting a death or a loss as a a gift of surrender to actually life in in the bigger sense you know, we tend to get very focused on what I call small L life, which is like just that's what's happening, you know, in your, you know, physical world. And then it's not. And, mm -hmm. you know, and you miss the big picture of big L life, which is a, a big, huge spiral of coming and going and creation and destruction and um transformation it's all happening it's that's just a cosmic you know yes. reality and that's just yeah. scientific i mean you don't even have to get woo woo here it's just go look out at you know the cosmos and study any of the quantum physicists and you see this like circularity and spiral um pattern in all of life all of the yes. universe and so that is just what's happening with loss. You know, it's just a spiral. It's just a space, a station along the way. And I think that loosening our, having the capacity to loosen our grip on that, the pain of it opens up space for, I think, first the curiosity and then the real mourning, like, I mean, that's real too, but there's also the mourning can be the savoring of the love that yeah. was there. 
um, is still there. So I don't know. I just feel like um, grief, grieving is just, uh, it's just living to me. It's just, yeah. how can you not, how can you be living and not grieving? Because it's just grieving to me is a, a celebration of life. Yes. Um, and not in that like event kind of way of celebrating, but yeah. No, I no, I, I actually completely know what you mean. And you know, Oceana, I have known you as someone most definitely who I, I know this about you, that you you are about accessing these liminal spaces. And that and we know, I know you and I know uh, that in, for example, in rooted and what we do, that we we really value opening into these kinds of spaces. And, you know, when you're talking about this practice or the, the, the cultivation of a kind of a skill or a, um, an ability to go into those spaces, you know, even in the little example of the pain in my butt, <laughs> there had to be, so real. there had to be a willingness to suspend a belief that the pain was too much. Or that, or maybe that it wasn't just pain, but it could be something else. Does that make sense? So yep. I think that there's a way in which, and I'm thinking about this, you know, for grief as well. And I can speak for myself as well, you know, many years ago, and maybe how I encountered grief in the past um, at different times, where the prospect of tipping into it, of even beginning to, to, to even dip a toe into pain or dip a toe into grief felt so scary and so overwhelming to me in part because of the beliefs I held about what it, you know, about what it could be, right? Like pain could be overwhelming. And if I go into the pain, it's going to consume me. The grief felt so big to me sometimes and in different moments of my life that to even dare put a toe into that water would, would risk being drowned by the ocean. And so the prospect of that feels so scary. This willingness to suspend the, this idea or this belief that it's going to swallow us whole. <laughs> how do we begin to play with that? And how do we do that? And maybe what a question for you is, what is the difference between how we relate to grief kind of individually and how communal grieving could support that? Okay, well, you just asked two different questions. So I'm going to start with the one and then I'm going to go to the next one. I think because it, it when we talk about communal grieving, um, especially in Rooted, we're often talking about ecological grieving. And so it's huge and it's quite enormous. Um, in fact, before we started talking, I was um, listening to a whale song uh, by Michaela Harrison. And we should put this link in the notes because that is um, a, a person who is doing incredibly intuitively sacred work around communicating with mm. whales via, by the way, a rooted in, rooted, I should say, in the Middle Passage. And that the, the, the the stories and the knowing that comes out of that for people of African descent, then how do you listen from that place to whales in current, in present time? And you can hear this like grieving. It's warning. It's grieving as warning, you know, uh, and and it's big. Yeah, mm. it is big. Uh, it's It's immense. And so how do you be with something that enormous, that painful, that catastrophic, that wide, broadly impactful? And I think you do it just like you do with your own personal pains that feel just so hard, hard so big, so vast, so deep. You touch in. That's really fair to just touch in go hang out at the edge of the sea at the edge of the sorrow at the edge of the pain just go and oh wait stay. Oceana yeah your sound oh your sound just dropped for a second 
you said go hang out at the edge of the sea and then the um the sound dropped for a second but now i think it's back i don't know why oh it must be the zoom so the way to be with these big griefs these big sorrows um it's like you would with the ocean and the climate change and even all the individual deep losses that feel just so enormous, like they're going to swallow you up is you can do one of two things, right? If you're an extreme sports fanatic like me, <laughs> you can dive in to see what happens. I don't recommend <laughs> that for everyone. You have to be well-resourced to know yourself really, really well to do that. Um, but for all the rest of us and me too at times just go to the edge just go to the edge of the sea go to the edge of the sorrow and just hang out there as long as you can or as long as you feel comfortable as long as it feels good and this brings me back to that beautiful piece of edge work that you know Weena has taken us on and rooted you know it doesn't make sense to go past your edge because you're just creating more trauma. Um, And then what is that good for? But the point is just to go just as far as you, it's comfortable as you can, maybe push a little bit into discomfort and just hang there for a second. And when you can't anymore, pull back. It's totally fair um, and righteous to step back from it you don't have to be in it all the time or you don't have to go as deep as you think you're supposed to go to be a you know conscious person just go to the edge that's actually more effective 100 percent. because that that edge work allows for more integration and for the experience to inform you if you're busy having a big reaction to a big experience that's not nearly as informative as you go to the edge and listen and feel this is the part that I think a lot of people um and this this could also be a big scary moment just to feel what is available there and again just do it to the extent that you can and don't go any further just hang with where you're comfortable and where your curiosity remains. And as soon as yeah. you find yourself in reaction, like, oh, oh, so exciting, or oh, oh, this is so hard, you know, pull back, step back, take a break. And then you can go back in. I do that all the time. I go in and I I stay as long as I can. I go out, I get resourced. And then I How go do you back resource? In. What are your, what are your resources? Oh, yeah. I resource with, um, I am a kinesthetic learner, so I need to, um, get out and I need to move. I often, um, change locations, change, you know, settings and I'll go outside. I'll talk to someone that I trust and know, not even necessarily about the thing, about something that is, that feels good. That is actually pleasurable. Pleasure is a resource. It actually refuels you to go back in and do some of the harder stuff. Um, so yeah, I just I turn my attention into towards something that I know feels good to me, and that's how I resource. I really appreciate that comment about pleasure being the resource that enables us to come back, and maybe dip a toe in even further than we did before or to hang out a little bit longer at the edge place because of course we know how positivity and pleasure even at times can be um, used as a distraction but you know that's when we're not necessarily willing to then metabolize um, go back and, and be with and maybe metabolize what needs to be metabolized and rather we're using it as some form of escape or avoidance And that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about it literally being that kind of pendulation that enables us to build that capacity for the integration of what feels too overwhelming to Mm. to be with. Well, and I'm glad you talked about metabolization because just like pain needs to be metabolized, pleasure needs to be metabolized too. I mean, it, it, it doesn't count 
in my mind, as a pleasurable experience if you were not actually in it. So this is where I start using metaphors like the, the difference between consuming unconsciously a bag of potato chips while watching, you know, what people call trash TV <laughs> versus actually spending time, you know, outdoors, feeling the wind on your skin, you know, um, having a, a sip of your your favorite, you know, beverage and just really savoring it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's spending time with that experience, like integrating it and metabolizing that. That's a truly pleasurable experience that can resource you. That's a very different experience than watching Nef a binge watching Netflix. That's not in my mind, and not for me anyway, a, re uh, an ex a pleasurable experience for one, you know, it's questionable and a one that's going to resource me. And that's what I'm looking to do when I'm really doing grief work or I'm really paying attention to things that are really hard or have a lot of charge to them. I'm looking for things that are actually going to feed me, feed my soul. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm wondering, Oceana, I mean, you, you talked about this a little bit already um, about how the importance of grief, right? And the, you, you mentioned something about it bringing us closer to life. And I think in this conversation here where we're talking about the metabolization of things that might be overwhelming. And I think, I feel, I feel like we can talk about this in a number of ways. In one sense, there are maybe the little, little, uh, little pockets of grieving that we do all the time. And then of course, there are a lot of experiences that our bodies might hold as a black woman, as a bicultural black woman, you know, we have, we have experiences in our family lines um, that, um, that we have inherited, right? There are experiences of grief that are not just contained to our individual lifetimes is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you'd be willing to speak a little bit, because I think the same principles apply, right? The same idea applies, but I'm also thinking about this idea that we're not meant to grieve alone. Um, some things aren't meant to be held alone. And I think that there's a way in which we can actually be in, in, physical or virtual space with other bodies as we're, um, and, and have that grief being held together. And I think there's also a way, and I know that I experienced this personally in which I truly felt and believed myself to be held in a cosmic way <laughs> in an experience of grief that I, I think enabled me to feel the bigness of that grief. Um, even though I was with other bodies, here and there, but not necessarily in the same ways we're talking about when we're talking about communally grieving. And I'm just wondering what that sparks for you and, and what might be interesting to kind of touch on, but I'm interested in this idea of the importance of a sense of our interconnection with other beings, other bodies, the cosmos, and what that means for us and our grieving. Oh gosh. Not our and not our grieving in the it's mine. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. how it enables that grief to move through. Right. Yeah. Um you know, it's all well and good to you know, and you should grieve on your own. You know, that that is a a, a very useful path. But to grieve among other beings is to literally add octane to me, to the process. When you mm. grieve in the company of others, mm. whether you do it virtually or in person, um, and then when I say others, I'm literally talking about not just humans, um, you know, animals, birds, trees, dirt, you know, rocks, yes. all alive. Ancestors. Yeah. Beings without bodies, right? Um, when you grieve in the company of others, there's this, um, you know, mechanism that comes into being, which you've sort of already alluded to. One of is one of them is co-regulation. It's kind of that's one of the things that mechanisms that occurs when you're grieving communally, that um, allows you, gives you that kind of energetic support to go further than you would on your own. And further meaning metabolize more, 
you know, um, experience more, feel more, and thereby metabolize more. So metabolization of grief in my mind is where you actually put your attention on it long enough and well enough that it shifts into something else. That's metabolization in any way that we're talking about it, right? So when you do that in the company of others, you get li the literal support of co-regulation, you know? So I I can think of a moment, oh, and this is kind of, is why I think grieving is important in terms of a liberatory journey. In 2020, I have still this very vivid frame of a memory of being on my, the floor of my bedroom wailing hmm. to the ancestors after experiencing an incredibly racist experience right inside hmm. my very own community among people who I thought loved me. Just and I, and so there I am wailing on the floor and the ancestors show up and I sing to them, I'm not going to make it. If this is how it's going to be, I'm not going to make it. And I could hear it. I could hear one of them say to me, I know. You can do this though. You have to do this a little bit longer. You're fine. You're going to be just fine keep going. I don't know, you want to call it a voice or that knowing out of the ethers. And I didn't feel mm. alone. I mm. felt held by my people. And you could say, it was just my imagination. It doesn't matter. I felt held by another. And so I could keep going. Yes. I yeah. cried some more. I bottomed out. And I felt held even as I was bottoming out. And then I use this metaphor a lot when I'm touching, talking about grief and liberation is you have to get to the bottom because I grew up with a swimming pool. And I know if you deep dive to the bottom and then you change your mind, like you want to come back up, swimming back up is so much harder than going all the way to the bottom of the pool and touching down and pushing yourself back up. You get back up faster and it's easier, less effort, but you have to go all the way to the bottom. You have to push through your fear. Am I going to make it? Am I going to run out of air? I can't tell you how many times I did that as a kid. And every yeah. single time I thought, am I going to make it? Am I going to run out of air? And I never did. I got to the bottom. I relaxed my fear it's not, I mean, I don't have a, a magic formula for how you relax, but at some point you just have to, because you know, your fear is sucking the air out of you. So the only way you're going to get more air is to simply literally relax. You touch bottom, you push off, you're back in the surface. And I've tried the other way where I turn around and swim back up and I, and I feel like I barely make it versus doing it the other way. So this way of, and I think this is what community gives you. Community gives you that holding so that you can go all the way to the bottom and touch back up, kick yourself back up with, and that, and that kick back up is a fresh insight, right? Because when I hit bottom in that particular memory that I just described, then the what what pushed me back up, as you as you said, was that genetic resilience. It was hundreds of years of, of black women who were like, no, we're gonna do this. Yes. I'm actually literally watching this right now. This is happening right now. I hope I don't mm. cry. In mm. the place where I live, the only black farmer. The only black farmer in Jefferson County 
is experiencing an incredible amount of systemic racism right here, right now. And he and his mother, who just a few years older than me, um, you know, I have, have held her in her tears and her pain of dealing with this ongoing, relentless um, situation with a, a local hog farmer essentially trying to run them off their land wow. with all manner of um, mischief. And she's like, no. And she'll say, I'm not going to make it. And I'll hold her and I'll say, I know. And then five minutes later, she's back. Okay, mm. I got this. It is so incredible. Mm. And I know you've had this experience to watch a human, any being actually, shatter and then in a moment put themselves back together. It's been done. You might not think you can do it in the moment, but it has been done and it will be done again. And you can do it too because you have already done it. A lot of people think they're so fragile. I don't know. But the truth is, if you go back and I and I actually invite you to excavate your own history for moments when you have felt shattered. And then somehow you found a resource, you found a way to pull something out of it, pull yourself back some way and go on. And that is that's already a resource you contain within you and you can tap back into that, you know? So, and that's what community does. Mm -hmm. Community reminds you, you can do this. It has been done. We are here. We have done it. We will do it again. So that, that both that co-regulation and that sense of um, intercorporeality, which I can almost always never say well but you know <laughs> that was beautifully intercorporeality said. <laughs> which is you know we all have bodies we all have living bodies and you can see that life is still happening you can tap into life that is still happening around you because they there's another living being there recognition of another living being like okay life is going on even though there might be some shattering there might be some rupture there is a life, there is life happening. And I can touch into that. And that's what communal yeah. greeting gives you also is this sense that there is still life. There's still aliveness. There's still resource. There's still. Can we, could I say desire? Yes. I, I, you're, you, what, I love, absolutely love what you've brought in with this and the analogy of touching down, you know, having to get to the bottom to get, to go back up again and, you know, earlier this week, I was speaking with our dear, dear friend, Erin, um, and she, uh, I, it, you know, it was one of those days I've, I've been going through it recently. And on this particular day, I just want to acknowledge the super blue moon that we just had yesterday and the moon that I have in Pisces and all of the ways that it was working on me. And to quote my, to, uh, to quote Weena, the psychic pain she used that term. And I was like, yeah, that's exactly what it felt like psychic pain. It was also for me this week when, and when I was speaking to Aaron, it was so alive. It was just one of those moments for me where I just felt, I felt like I could feel the pain and the sadness, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> it was one of those moments where I felt like I could feel the pain and the sadness of the world. Um, there was a kind of a grief in me that felt so big and it did not feel like it was mine. Um, I don't know if it was in, even in my lineages. It felt like I could feel the pain of the world. It was, you know, we're on the heels of this shooting in Florida. I just mm. want to say that I was in the throes of a grief that felt like, I don't even know if it felt like it had a bottom. So mm -hmm. I was, um, I was talking to I was talking with Aaron and um, we ended up getting on this conversation and I really want to share something that she said, because when she said it, it re also reminded me of a, of another saying that, that ha had really guided me through some really difficult times in my life. Hold on one second. I want to find this really quick. Um, we can always uh, just pause this part here, but I just want to share this with you because it was so, it felt like it was a really spontaneous moment for, 
Hold on a second. Let me just find it really quick. This is just a pause moment. Okay. So I was, I was really with this grief pretty hardcore. And it was one of those days where it didn't feel like, you know, when, when it felt so big, it, I didn't even, I couldn't even find the space on the edges of it to begin to feel into something else, even to find the resource. It was, it felt that challenging that day. Mm. And, you know, she, when as I felt like it was going to swallow me whole. And she said to me, um, if your heart's not breaking, you'll probably be called to do things the same way. And I feel like this speaks to so many of the, th and what that brought me mm. to then when she, when we started to kind of unpack that, cause I was like, that shifted something already in me. And it reminded me of another saying that a, a teacher of mine many years ago had, um, and it went something like this. I think I'm paraphrasing here, but it was like, follow your pain, like a candle in the night to a place where desire is born. Follow your pain like a candle in the night to a place where desire is born. Mm. In every single moment when in my life that maybe grief or whatever experience was present that felt almost like it was going to destroy me like this, like in, in this example you're talking about of the this farmer's mother and and her experience of feeling like this is going to take me out, right? your presence there, I, I can, I can sense how your presence there would be the thing that enabled her to hit that, hit that floor and to realize that she's still alive. Right. And she's still, um, she's still part of this. And there's something about those moments for me that bring me to where, um, what I, what I wish to see in the world, what I wish to change in the world, the way I want to live differently, what matters to me most comes closest to me. It, it's almost like a, that pain becomes a, a truth that I can touch only when I'm able to hit that floor. Does that make sense? It, the, in, within, the, the, in the, within the ways that it cracks me open, it, let me start over because I'm, I'm going to edit this out because I'm, I'm all over the place. No, but you're, go, go, go. Cause this is cool. Yeah. No, it's, it's, I, it's, it's the, what I'm curious about is, is how grief has the potential to crack us open to such a degree that out of that experience comes, comes the birth, really the flowing of arrows of desire of life force. It's because it's in response to the pain, right? There's always mm -hmm. something on the other side of the pain. There's always something on the other side of the thing that we're grieving that wants to thrive, that wants to live, that wants to um, find its way into the world. And so I'm so curious about how desire is born from grief. And I mean, desire in in all of the life affirming ways that we can talk about desire, the desire to create worlds together, the desire to, you know what I mean? To, to maybe to, um, to live into new and other futures together, the desire to make real all of the things that we hold in our heart for this world and for, e for ourselves and for each other, the reclamation, the remembrance, all of the things that we want to do. I feel like desire for me has been born in those moments. Woof. I don't even know hardly how to say it better. But, but just to simply agree, yes. Um, when I talk about true desire, I'm talking about that place you get to where you have stripped away all of the superfluous desires and you're getting down to something, the bottom, something true, something real. And I do agree with you that even when I, the way I'm talking about it, getting down to that in itself sounds like what? Oh, a grief journey. Getting down to, through the layers of what you're shedding, what you're letting go of, beliefs, thoughts, to getting to something actually when you're letting go of that can i say this word shit yeah. that's been handed yeah. to you <laughs> yes you should society. say that word i like you that know, word. <laughs> the, 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 just the crap of programming and thoughts that have been handed to us about how we should respond if you mourn 
that, letting go of that. And that's a real, that should be honored, by the way. That's not nothing to Mm. shed those old beliefs. It sounds, people say it so easily and blithely, and it's not nothing. It's been like the Borg, right? (laughs) If there are any Trekkies on here, you know, it's like, or even the matrix, it's like taking out those, you know, mechanical things that the matrix or the Borg has put into you to give you the sort of artificial life. When you start removing the artificial stuff, the stuff that was just put into you and you get to the real stuff, the living stuff, that should be honored. There's a mourning that happens there. There's a grieving. And in that grieving, it's true. I agree with you. You get down to the real the real nitty gritty. And it's true. I I often talk about grief as a journey because it's, there is something on the other side, but you have to cross the sea, um, the land, you have to make the journey and it's going to be hard and it's going to be fraught and there's going to be joy and laughter along the way too. I mean, it's not this one dimensional thing. It's all the things so, but you have to be willing to make that journey and it's good to have buddies. <laughs> That's yeah. true. Um, but yeah, when you cross the sea of grief and you get to the other side, to me, that's the, li- that's the liberatory. That's where you get to something new, something that's been liberated from our conditioned past. I love this statement. If your heart's not breaking, you're only going to be called to do things the same. I see this all the time. People don't want to go there. It, you know, that's happening right now in the situation with, you know, this farmer. People only want to do a little. They don't want to go all in. They just want to like, okay, I'll drop a meal off. And, you know, or are we still talking about this? Why, you know, mm. um, they don't only want to go so far. But if you go all in to anything, you just, you can choose. It doesn't have to be what, you know, whatever, whatever calls you, you go all in. And it's true. It's sort of the scraping away experience of, well, that's not working and that's not serving and that's not working. And that belief, you know, you just stay present to what is and you get to, to the bottom of some truth, true desire. It's so funny you say that because, you know, I've been doing this local podcast. I've been talking to people of the global majority here where I live. And we did our final recording yesterday. It was our 10th one, maybe 12th actually, because there were some bigger ones. But in all of these conversations about hardship and pain and how people overcame and what people are creating as a result, literally generating Where we got to at the end of that yesterday was, oh, I see. There is nothing for us here on the plantation. Hmm. You know, on the, in the, you can do all the policy and, you know, equity, you know, shift whatever you want to do with fixing the system. But that's not where the life is. The life for us is going to be outside the system. And you can only, I think I had that nugget before I started, but it wasn't until I went through all of those conversations and went down again and down again and down again into the pain of what it is to live in a black and brown body in this, you know, very white liberal place I live. Still, the pain of lived experience here over and over again that I got to something new. I feel like we kind of collectively got to something new. It was a flash. It was like, it wasn't even like small. It wasn't frivolous to say, you know, I think we should be doing this outside the system. It sounds kind of like wishful thinking, but in the moment when we, the four of us arrived at that space, it was so real, Kareen. Mm. And it was real in the sense that to use a cosmic metaphor, right? Real in the sense that you could feel like there had been this black hole of white supremacy, right? Sucking the air out of the room over and over again. And we, because we had been in the conversation, we let ourselves go down the hole. 
And we kind of even came out of this black hole into some other place. It was almost like the the infinitesimally small birth of a new star, not fully formed, but just the beginning of it. And it was tangible and real. You know that moment where you collectively know something just changed? Yes. That is what happened. And it is happening. Like now that's in the four of us, or maybe the fractally speaking, now, now it's rippling out into our community. This idea like, you know, we can be, we can do this. We can literally create systems that of us, by us, for us, uh, food systems, Social justice, I mean, I mean, transformative justice systems, you know, um, mm. educational systems, we are already doing it in these very mm. small ways. But now there's like, yeah, something just like a star got born. That's incredible. And do, that's, do you know, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was, I'm going to say, and that's, and I, I'm just repeating myself now, I think, but that's because we went down into the black hole. We let the we let the black hole suck us. But it wasn't in a in a but we were together, right? We, yeah. we were together. So it wasn't like it was hopeless. It was more like, okay, well, let's go all the way down. Somebody somewhere among us is gonna find something out of this. We trusted that. And yeah. Well, you're making me think, and I feel like we could go off on an, a whole nother tangent, a really fruitful conversation around around the ways in which, you know, in speaking about what it means to be in these mixed spaces um, and in, in knowing the importance of, of resourcing and in, in affinity like spaces, also, you know, having these experience in mix or mixed spaces with other bodies that in those experiences, they become like this crucible for us. And like in, in the process, we are, it, there is a cultivation that's happening. What I heard you say, and if I feel like if I heard you correctly, was that it was only within the crucible of those experiences that something else could be born and your willingness yeah. to kind of be in them and experience them. And it might, it reminded me a bit of uh, Fred Moten and Saida Hartman. I, I don't know if they, I think it's Saida Hartman who talks about the black outdoors, um, but the idea of a like of a shimmer of an alternative, right, that becomes possible beyond this kind of colonial capture of our imaginations about who we are, who we who we can be, who we can become. And that's what I heard you say, but it's only in in the kind of almost the crucible of the experience that we get to know that. Well, and you know, let's talk about these mixed spaces because that's also happening here too. Um you know, I've been here for two years and you know me, I've had a one singular vision, which is, can we actually find a way to thrive off the plantation? Um, and this is, a, I think, a relatively new idea to live into, right? To actually live into. And we are lucky because we live in a semi-agricultural, you know, region, so you could actually live off the grid and people do here all, all over the place. So that's just a real reality um, that we can live into. But it's only been in this way that we've been together in the finding our way, resourcing ourselves, nurturing the, 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 the hurt, the traumas well enough that we're sort of resourced that now we're starting to come into, there's desire, there's actual desire to come into community with white bodies here in town. We actually created a, a very sp specific and deliberate group of people in white bodies called the co-conspirators. Hmm. They are doing their work in anti-blackness, the culture, you know, white supremacist culture, they're doing their work and we are doing our work. And it's only just sort of now that like, maybe we could start to think about in different, not everybody, only some mm -hmm. people are able to come together in that, you know, interstitial place of, whoa, how are we going to actually make our way forward together? But it's, 
it's because we have been, everybody, each of us has been resourced in the places that inform who we can be outside of the plantation, outside of white supremacist culture. And that's of everybody, like who we can be, that imagination, those imaginal cells, you know, that Alexa uh, Garcia talks about, they've been, you know, enlivened, they've been nurtured, these imaginal cells of what's possible. Mm. Um, but that didn't come at any, I mean, there was a cost to that. And there's still a cost, mm. you know, to untether yourself from what I call the matrix is it's it's a it's a moment by moment proposition and there's going to be grief and there's going to be yes. sorrow and loss but there's also <sighs> yes oh space so to beautiful. breathe yeah and maybe we could say not only is there going to be grief there needs to be grief it it feels like it's just it's just a part of the process it's just a part of the the composting that has to happen. Yeah. You cannot have life without death. You cannot have life without loss. You can't have life without compost. You can't That's grow right. anything without I I can tell you that for sure. I've been trying to grow my own farm. <laughs> I mean, trying to grow our own food here now because we've got this whole re food resilience program we started in the spring. Our soil was so bad. It had nothing <laughs> in it. It was just complete like modernity it was like the very stripped of all of modernity the, yeah of everything. stripped of all life right play you know <laughs> and so we've been throwing our compost into it as much as we can to make it into you know what um there's this thing in africa on the in the sahara they call you probably know about this um it's called um black earth mm, and it's like just, terra preta yeah, I, I know of that from South America, but go ahead. I'm curious. But it's what you're made say. of it, they literally made out of uh, worm castings, and that's how mm. it gets its color. It's made out of literal worm shit, you know. <laughs> so, you know, you have you can't you you can't have new life without death. It's just yeah. part of it. The living yeah. is the dying, and the dying is the living. Oceana, I, I feel like there's no more beautiful place to land than there. Um, maybe before we wrap up this conversation, I'm just curious, maybe what kind of invitation you might extend to somebody who is wondering what it means to be in a grief space and rooted with you. But I'm still with the um, the desire part. That is so good. I know. Fire comes out of. When it comes to desire, I I don't I don't know. Maybe we shouldn't say it. I shouldn't say this now because then we'll it'll be a little bit disjointed the conversation. But I, it makes me think of you and I had a conversation when we talked last summer for my field work, and we were talking. I think I was talking to you about desire paths, and you know which are these you know, in, in any kind of like, you know, like say a national park where they create a system of pathways. Oh, yeah. Right. And these are, these are imposed pathways that, you know, it was the park service decided this would be the best path to take, but then for whatever reason, people felt called to take another path, you know, that's, that wasn't marked, but they would do it repeatedly enough that a new path would form very organically, purely out of desire to go this way, right? Mm. And so we we talk all the time in Rooted, or I feel like in general, we don't talk necessarily talk about desire paths, but a big part of what we're talking about when it comes to our, you know, what happens in our disorientation is that we're learning to refine another kind of compass and to follow another kind of North Star that, mm -hmm. that that feels scary because it, it it wasn't the path that was given to us, right? Um, and so it can feel a little bit scary 
And at the same time, we're learning to attune to those calls when they come, come this way, go that way. Don't go that way. But we're learning to trust, listen to, and then trust another voice, which is a very, very big deal for most of us who have been born within modernity to actually learn how to do. And I see a correlation between, I think for me in one, in one way, grief is a profoundly disorienting experience in the mm -hmm. sense that it can, it can be the thing that very powerfully, depending on the, on the, you know, on the kind of intensity of the grief untether us from our mm -hmm. habituated ways of being in the world right. and the way we do things. Like suddenly everything is called into question. You know, things that we do that we think are so important suddenly don't feel so so important anymore. Everything is turned on its head. It's like, and and there it within the kind of within the space of that, I feel like we learn to listen differently. We can, we can mm -hmm. learn to be attuned very differently to something else that's calling. At least that's been my experience of many, many times of grief. Well, and thank you for reminding me about the, the park service pass. That was good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel like in that piece, there's something that came forward in me, which is like, there's something about grieving, the act of grieving, the act of wailing, the act of laughing so hard out of nowhere, because you're just like, oh, uh -huh. oh, I've done that. That, that, that <laughs> intense, that intense expression is like literally burning up. It's like burning up the old ways. It's burning yes. up the old stuff. It's burning. Yes. You need to, you need to burn through that old shit. Yes. The stuff that's passing away. And that's what it's for, by the way, this, the, the, the things ending the way to honor them is use them up, like use them as fuel for the next thing. So you do that by the wailing, the expressing, the laughing, the <clears throat> the anger, whatever the rage, you, you burn that up. And that's how you get down, I think, to the flame of true desire. That's how I experience it. It's 100%. almost like you burned everything away and then you get down to this one flame. Like in that death dissolution meditation, you get mm -hmm. down, everything dissolves. Yes. And then you get to the flame of life, which goes out and then you're left there with nothing. And then a light emerges, you know, mm -hmm. in the darkness. And that is a something true. I love that you brought the element of fire into it. And you can think of all the examples in the natural world where fire is the, is the is the catalyzer, right, for new life, and mm -hmm. the importance of it in that one of its roles in that process. And so I really appreciate you bringing that element in because it feels so so true. I love that idea that the that the the old ways are absolutely um, incinerated in the experience in that really in the intensity in the. What's a word for a, a, what's a word for a container that burns like a incinerator? What's the word I'm looking for? Um, oh, I don't know. I can't find the word. It doesn't matter. But cauldron oven. Yeah. Yeah. The cauld. Yeah. Cauldron oven. Yeah. But the the element of fire as being part of that feels so beautiful. And I also feel like that's where that's where I can feel like the yeah. I mean, this is I think a little bit goes in the vein of the conversation we had um, for the breathing wind podcast around grief and joy. I know I had yeah. brought some stuff in about that as well. And, and this is where they both live. It's like, you know, the, the, the absolute, the cycling down, the touching the ground, getting to the bottom of, and the joy and the welling up of life again in another form and the cycle of it. That's it. Yeah, that's it. And I feel like in Rooted, we make space for that. We we bring in, in our Rooted grief spaces, we bring in all the elements. You have to come with all the elements. And we um, lean into, though, as a, as a community, we lean into the fire as the alchemist for what it is that we are wanting to transform. It's funny, I, I toggle between talking about 
the losses in that space and the stuff that we simply want to transform. It's one and the same to me, but we, we create space for that. And we, we have people write their losses or what they're transforming on paper and they can burn it up. They can tear it up, put it into water and put it on the ground. They can bury it. They can use whatever elemental forces they feel called to metabolize that thing that they are transforming or letting go of. And we do that as a community. And this is the grief space in Rooted. It's, it's, I, as I said in the one of the our open house, it's the only space in Rooted where you cannot come late and you cannot hang out. It is not a download space. You, everyone in that space is a full participant. And if you're not available to fully participate, then don't you, that you don't have to be in the space. It's just not the space for you that day. Come when you can. And um and it, and it, and participation, by the way, doesn't look like being on camera and you know doing all the things. I can feel every single person in that space whether they're mm. on camera or off camera and I can feel them because they are fully there. Mm. And that's what that mm. space requires. And people who are actively more actively participating, like they're on camera and they're putting stuff into the, the fire because we bring a live fire into the, into the space. Well, it's a YouTube fire and um, yeah, people put stuff in there and, I am always surprised where it goes. Always. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hoshiana. Thank you. Thank you for this conversation. Always. I have learned so much from you um, and with you um, about grief as a liberatory practice. And um, I just love you so much and I appreciate you. I love you too. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. We don't take for granted what it means to dedicate your time and energy to us. So thank you for listening. And if you're curious to learn more about what we get up to in Rooted, check out rootedglobalvillage.com or follow us on Instagram at tending.the.roots. Be well. <laughs>